Section twenty eight of Marion Harland's Complete Etiquette. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Piotr Natter. Marion Harland's Complete Etiquette by Marion Harland and Virginia van der Water. Chapter twenty eight in Sports. Sport, scientists tell us, is a relic of prehistoric pursuits, and the so-called sporting instinct is a stirring of the primeval nature within civilized breasts. Perhaps that is why more people forget the first tenets of good breeding when competing in various forms of outdoor exercise than in nearly all the other walks of life put together. The man who would view with an amiable smirk the spilling of a glass of burgundy over his white waistcoat at a dinner will often exhibit babyish rage at the breaking of a favorite golf club or the stupidity of a caddy. The girl whose self-control permits her to smile and murmur, it's really of no consequence. When a dance partner's foot tears three yards of lace of her train, will seldom show the same calm good humor when her opponent at tennis serves balls that are too swift and too hard driven for her to return. There are many concrete and a few general rules for behavior in sport of all sorts, the observance or neglect of which denotes the thoroughbred or the boor far more accurately than would a week of full of ordinary routine. The general rules apply to every form of sport. They are briefly, first, last, and always, keep your temper. Remember the word sport means pastime. When it becomes a cause of annoyance or impatience, or an occasion for loss of temper, it misses its true aim, and you are not worthy to continue it. Remember the other man. Second, the other fellow has quite as much right to a good time as you have. Do not play selfishly, or vaunt your superiority over him. In all contests show no elation at victory, or chagrin at defeat. This is the first and great law. Its observance differentiates the true sportsman from the mere sporting man. Third, play fairly. The man or girl who will take an undue advantage of any description over an opponent not only breaks the most sacred rules of good breeding, but robs himself or herself of the real enjoyment of the game. Fourth, no sport in which people of breeding can participate demands loud talking, ill-bred language or actions or the abridgment of any of the small, sweet courtesies of life. To sum up, good breeding, fairness, self-control, and patience are needful equipments. Without any and all of these, no man or woman should take part in sports. The Golf Player Golf, perhaps, more than any other outdoor pastime, demands a thorough and judicious blend of the foregoing qualities. The old story of the Scottish clergyman, whose conscience would not allow him to continue both golf and the ministry, and who therefore abandoned the latter, was of course an exaggeration. But the idea it expresses is by no means absurd. When a crowd of people throng the links, when novice and adept, crank and mere exercise seeker are jumbled together in seeming confusion, it is not always easy to keep a cool head a sweet temper and a resolution neither to give nor to take offence many a golf player errs in behaviour less through ill intent than through heedlessness and ignorance of what the etiquette of the occasion demands such enthusiasts may profit by the ensuing rules which cover the more salient points of decorum and which may enable the beginner to avoid many a pitfall when two players drive off from the tee, they should always wait until the couple in front of them have made their second shot and walked off from it. Thus confusion is averted, and the proper distance maintained. It is a simple rule, but one often broken. Three players should always let a pair of players pass them. Not only should they grant the desired position, but they should offer to do so before the question, may we pass, can be asked. The pair in question should, in case such permission is not volunteered, ask politely to be allowed to move forward. The yell of four is all the strict rules of the game demand, but the rules of breeding should come first. A single player must give way to all larger parties. 
this is but fair since golf is pre-eminently a match and those actively engaged in the contest should have the right of way over a man who is merely practicing the single player must recognize and yield with good grace if he desires unobstructed practice let him choose some time when the links are vacant on the putting green never drive on the putting green when other players are there putting out players should not neglect to get off the green the moment they have holed out the place is not intended as an isle of safety or a clubhouse corner where scores may be computed gossip exchanged or the work of others watched if you are at the tee waiting for others to drive off never speak cough or in any way distract the attention of the player who is addressing the ball inconsiderate or ill-bred people in this way spoil hundreds of good drives and thousands of good tempers every year when a man and a woman are playing golf the latter should always be allowed to proceed on the following drive off from the first tee a man playing against a woman should not allow himself to get too far ahead of her do not leave her to plot on alone this same rule applies when playing with another man do not go after the ball after a drive until your opponent drives then walk together in pursuit never go ahead of your partner avoid haste in golf use no undue haste in golf never run if you are not employing a caddy always offer to carry the clubs of the woman with whom you are playing in the same circumstances offer to make the tee from which she is to drive off it is optional with her whether or not to accept your offer when you have no caddy allow players who have caddies to pass you they will go faster than you and should have the right of way never make unfavorable criticisms of others play never above all laugh at any of their blunders when motoring automobiling has so increased in popularity that it is almost a national pastime and with its growing favor has sprung up a noxious and flourishing crop of bad manners there seems to be something about the speed the smell of gasoline or the sense of superiority over slower vehicles that robs many an otherwise well-bred automobilist of all consideration yet the utmost consideration is due not only to mere mortals but to fellow motormen common humanity as well as civility should always prompt a chauffeur to stop at sight of a disabled car and to ask if he can be of assistance to offer the loan of any necessary tools or extra gasoline or even if necessary to volunteer a tow do not presume on the community of interests to address the chauffeur or passengers of a passing car any more than the passengers of one ordinary vehicle would address those of another do not stare at another's car nor if at a standstill examine the mechanism this is the height of rudeness the fact that you are so lucky as to own a car gives you no license to investigate the workings of another man's machine or in other ways to make yourself obnoxious when passing a car of inferior horsepower do not choose that moment to exhibit your own greater speed be careful also not to give such a car your dust nor as far as you can avoid to sicken its occupants with the smell of your motor's gasoline do not boast of the phenomenal runs you have made you are not a record holder and when you become one the newspapers will gladly exploit the fact without any viva voce testimony from you when meeting a horse vehicle watch closely to see if the horse shows signs of fear if he does completely stop your car and if the driver of the horse be a woman dismount and lead the horse past your car do not violate the speed ordinance the ordinance was made for public safety not to spite you do not frighten animals or pedestrians nor carelessly steer too near to some farmer's livestock which may happen to be in the road remember the owner of the chickens or dogs you may run over is helping to pay for the smooth road you are traversing the road is partly his and you are in a measure his guest rules for tennis tennis offers fewer opportunities for breaks than do many other of the sports of the hour yet good breeding is here as necessary as when playing any other game if you have a woman for a partner and it is her serve do not neglect to pick up and hand her the balls before each service 
second her more carefully than if she were a man, and take charge of extra ball for her. If a woman is your opponent, remember that she has not the strength and endurance of a man. Serve gently. Do not slam balls over the net at cannonball speed and force. Oppose only moderate strength to her lesser power. Give her the benefit of the doubt in case of a let, or when the ball may or may not be over the back line. In double service, do not serve the second ball until she has recovered her position from pursuing the first. The choice of rackets should also, of course, be hers, and any work, such as putting up the nets, hunting the lost ball, and so on, devolves on you. The Yachtsman as Host The yachtsman is of two classes. The man who delights in the danger and seamanship incident on a cranky wind-jammer in a heavy sea, and the man whose boat is a floating clubhouse. Both types are prone to forget at times that their guests are not so enthusiastic as themselves, that they may be nervous or inclined to seasickness, and that the amusements of their host may not always appeal to them. The man who would never think of causing inconvenience to a guest on land will show impatience or lack of sympathy at the same guest's timidity or mal de mer when afloat. The same rules of behavior that obtain between host and guest ashore should prevail on the yacht. The tastes of the latter should be as scrupulously considered, and his or her likes and dislikes be as considerately met. Canoeing Similar laws of social usage apply to boating and canoeing. The fool that rocks the boat has received so many warnings and such just and wholesome condemnation that there is no use wasting further words on him. No man who values the safety and comfort of his companion will do anything to imperil either. A man should always offer to row, but should give the girl who is with him the option of doing so if she wishes. He should hold the boat steady for her and assist her to embark, having previously arranged the cushions in the stern and made all the other possible plans for her comfort. The course they are to take should always be left to her choice, and her wishes should be consulted in every way. A girl would also do well to remember that the man who has taken her boating is doing all the work and is trying to give her a pleasant time. She should meet him halfway and should try to repress any nervousness she might experience in being on the water and should welcome the opportunity to help when occasionally requested by her skipper to trim boat. Swimming is essentially a man's sport. While many women are good swimmers, they usually lack the strength and endurance to make them men's equals in this line. A man should therefore be careful to avoid overtaxing the strength of the girl who is swimming with him, should be content to remain near the shore if she so desire, and in surf-bathing should lift her over the breakers or try to shield her from their force. In teaching others to swim, infinite patience, good temper and tact are needful. Allow for the nervousness and awkwardness which are almost inseparable attributes of beginners driving and riding in driving always ask your companion if she or he would prefer to handle the reins do not by bursts of speed or by fights with a fractious horse endanger the safety or composure of your guest in riding horseback never remain mounted when addressing some friend who is on foot if your initial salute is to be followed by any conversation dismount and remain on foot while you take your leave in helping a girl to the saddle, extend your hand that she may place her left foot in the palm, and on the same instant that you raise the hand, she will spring into the saddle. Always adjust the curb and snaffle. Hand them to her, and arrange her riding habit before you mount your own horse. Cross-saddle riding for women is now so common that it is generally accepted. Still, a girl who makes a visit where she expects to ride should make sure her hostess approves this method before she adopts it. Those who hold that a lady should use a side saddle feel strongly on the subject. Good breeding in games. There are countless pitfalls for the unwary in all forms of sport, but none that cannot be readily bridged by consideration for others, by good temper, and by the commonest rules of breeding. One general rule for all sports and games is, do not take part unless you can play reasonably well. 
to do so otherwise is sure to embarrass you and to interfere with the pleasure of others end of section twenty eight section twenty nine of marion harlan's complete etiquette this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by tracy butterick marion harlan's complete etiquette by marion harland chapter twenty nine mrs newly rich and her social duties we have ridiculed our newly rich woman's fads pretensions and failures so sharply and for so long that we find it hard to do justice to the solid virtues she often possesses the average specimen is fair game and we one and all from the gentlest to the most sarcastic unite in setting her down except perhaps the mother-in-law no other woman supplies fun makers with such abundant and cheap material she might retaliate on her persecutors more frequently than she does by attributing much of the ridicule fine and coarse heaped on her to envy far meaner than the meanest of her pretensions thus much for the average specimen at her worst the exceptions to the ignoble parvenu are numerous enough to form a class by themselves it is not a disgrace in this country of dizzying down-sittings and bewildering uprisings for miner, mechanic, merchant, or manufacturer to make money fast. It is to his credit when he insists that the girl, who was poorer than himself when they were married, and who has kept him at his best physical and mental estate ever since by wise management of their modest household, making every dollar do the work of a dollar and a quarter while feeding and clothing her family should get the full benefit of his changed fortunes in house furniture clothing company and what he names vaguely a good time generally he means that she shall ruffle it with the bravest of her associates he means also that these associates shall be in accord with his means and the intention need not be in vain a woman who is by instinct a lady and who is at all clever in observing the little things she lacks and acquiring them will find herself received by as many delightful people as she has time for and inwardly she may take courage from a witty woman's remark i'd as soon be the newly rich as the always poor mr newly rich however the odds are all against the chances that our worthy money-maker himself will conform his personal behavior to the new conditions husbands of this type leave all that sort of thing to wives and daughters and make the social advancement of these women harder thereby not the least formidable obstacle in their upward journey is the stubborn fact that your father is quite impossible social polish men as a whole do not take polish readily as john newlyrich did not wear a dress coat before he was twenty-one he is seldom quite at ease in a swallow tail at forty as a millionaire of fifty he rebels against the obligation to wear it to the family dinner every evening in the week if he has read dickens which is hardly likely he echoes mrs boffin's lor let us be comfortable he butters a whole slice of bread using his knife trowel-wise and if busy talking of something that interests him particularly he lays the slice upon the cloth during the troweling he cuts up his salad and makes the knife a good second to a fork while eating fish loyal to the memories of early life he never gets over the habit of speaking of dinner as supper and observes in conversation at a fashionable reception as i was eating my dinner at noon to-day in like absent-mindedness he tucks his napkin into his collar to protect the expanse of shirt front exposed by the low-cut waistcoat of his dress suit he says sir to his equals and addresses facetious remarks to the butler or draws the waitress into conversation while meals are going on anxious wife and despairing daughters 
are grateful if he does not put his knife into his mouth when off guard. Trifles, are they? Not to the climbers, who are exercised thereby. They are gravel between the teeth and pebbles in the dainty footwear of Mrs. Newly Rich. The history of her social struggles would be incomplete without the mention of this drawback. She has learned the bylaws of social usage by heart, and loving and loyal wife though she is, she sometimes loses patience with John for not doing the same. Proper Social Aspiration In this, and in many other social perplexity, more or less grievous, our heroine has our sympathy and deserves our respect. We use the word heroine advisedly. We have put the wealthy, pushing vulgarian, who is part of the stock company of caricature and joke right, entirely out of the question. She has her sphere and her reward. Our business is with the woman of worthy aspirations and innate refinement, raised by a whirl of fortune's wheel, from decent poverty to actual wealth. She has a natural desire to mingle on equal terms with the better sort of rich people. She is glad of her wealth, but not purse-proud. It has introduced her to another world of her social life. It may be truly said that old things have passed away and all things have become new. It would be phenomenal if she fitted at once and easily into it. Money has bought her a fine house, and for money, the artistic upholsterer has furnished it. Money has hired a staff of servants, whereas up to now, a maid of all work was her sole help. Elegance in speech. Money does not enable her to master the shibboleth that would be her passport to the land she would possess, and to mangle it into sibboleth as the least sophisticated of us know, means social slaughter at the passages of Jordan. One's speech and manner of speaking are of the first importance socially, and fortunately it is not difficult to improve them if one earnestly determines to do so. One may frankly take private lessons, or one may learn much by listening closely to the talk of people of high social finish. One should not, however, imitate slavishly or attempt the impossible. To use the broad A gracefully, one must either have been born to it or assiduously trained in one's younger days. Otherwise, it is bound to seem an affectation, an error heard with surprising frequency even from well-educated people is the use of don't for doesn't. In Sesame and Lily's Ruskin remarks, a false accent or mistaken syllable is enough in the parliament of any civilized nation to assign a man to a certain degree of inferior standing forever. This is an extreme statement, of course, but there is much truth in it. One thing Mrs. Newlyrich sometimes mistakenly permits is the correcting of her grammatical blunders and her husbands by their better educated children. To allow this shows a wrong sense of proportion. It is infinitely more important for a child to respect his parents and to show them respect than that the laws of Lindley Murray be observed. As to foreign phrases, seldom use a foreign phrase even if you have perfectly mastered its meaning and pronunciation. The well of English undefiled is usually sufficient for all needs. People who constantly sprinkle their conversation and letters with dictionary, French, or Latin lay themselves open to the charge of affectation. Certain foreign words, once accorded their original pronunciation, are now habitually anglicized. One of the commonest of these is valet, which is now spoken as if it were an ordinary English word. Engage no servant who patronizes you. Give your maids to understand at the outset that you are the head of the house and know perfectly well what you want each one to do and how your household is to be run. Be kind with all, familiar with none. They are your severest critics. 
never speak to them of your husband by his christian name your daughter should be miss mary and your son master john in this connection breakfast is on luncheon is ready dinner is served are the correct formulas that you should require at the announcement of a meal assert yourself with dignity never defiantly your servants have nothing to do with your past or with anything connected with your personal history beyond the present relation existing between you and them they will discuss and criticize you below stairs and on evenings out and in the event of changing their place to the next mistress who will stoop to listen to them they would do the same were you a princess with a thousand-year-old pedigree stand in your lot and be philosophical you cannot be too punctilious in not questioning them about how things were done in other houses in which they have been employed every such query will be construed into ignorance and diffidence be a law unto yourself and unto them words to be avoided learn to speak of your maid or maids not of your girl if you have two call one the cook and the other the housemaid girl is in itself a perfectly good word but it has like some other good words as genteel become debased by getting into indifferent company in referring to your family avoid the word folks which has been decreed inelegant substitute folk or people do not overwork the word lady never speak of a sales lady though this does not mean that any particular girl or woman serving behind a shop counter may not be a lady in every essential of the word train yourself in the nice distinctions that dictate when one shall say woman or lady when man and when gentleman the terms lady friend or gentleman friend are never to be used never say excuse me leave that to the person who calls herself a sales lady social awkwardness yet you must learn how the people live whom you would meet upon common ground as old to them as it is new to you you blush in confessing that you are bewildered as to the order in which the various forks are to be used that lie beside your plate at the few state dinners you attend entrees are many and some appallingly unfamiliar you wonder mutely what these people would think of you if they knew that you were never taken in to dinner by a man until to-night and how narrowly you watch the hostess or the woman across the way before you dare advance upon the course set before you dreading awkward stiffness that would betray preoccupation you attract attention by a show of gaiety unlike your usual behavior and unsuited to time and place should you make a mistake such as using a spoon instead of the ice cream fork you are abashed to misery don't apologize however gross the solecism in eighteen times out of twenty nobody has noticed the misadventure in twenty cases out of a score if it were observed you are the one person who would care a picayune about it or ever think of it again another cardinal principle is to learn to consider yourself as a minute fractional part of society when your name is bawled out by usher or footman at a large party it sounds like the trump of doom in your unaccustomed ears to your excited imagination all eyes are riveted upon you in point of fact you are of no more consequence to the eyes ears and minds of your fellow guests than the carpet that seems to rise to meet your uncertain feet stubborn conviction of your insignificance is the first step that counts in acquisition of well-mannered composure among your fellows making acquaintances in forming new acquaintances be courteous in the reception of advances and slow in making them until you have reason to think that you are liked for yourself and not because your husband represents six or it may be seven numerals there are sure to be dozens of critics who will accuse you of parading these figures as vessels fly bunting in entering a strange harbor stamp on your mind 
that adventitious circumstance has nothing to do with the worth of you yourself for a long while after you embark upon your new life be watchful and studious yet covertly lest your study be noted return calls promptly sending in the right number of cards and bearing yourself in conversation with gentle self-possession never be flattered by any attention into a flutter of pleasure above all do not be obsequious be the person who honors you by social notice a multimillionaire or the chief magistrate of these united states servility is invariably vulgarity familiarity is if possible a half degree more repulsive self-respect and a wholesome oblivion of dollars and cents are a catholicon amid the temptations of your novel sphere if you chance to entertain someone who is still as obscure as you were once yourself avoid all temptation to make a display or to be patronizing i am so glad you could come tonight effusively commented such a hostess to one of her guests i know you go out so seldom the guest in question showed by her silence that she did not relish being publicly reminded that she was of limited social opportunities avoid novelties when you begin to entertain in your turn avoid scrupulously startling effects and novelties of all kinds until you are used to the task be strictly conventional in arrangements for your guests reception and pleasure let floral decorations and souvenirs be modest and tasteful mantles banked with orchids boutonnieres of hot-house roses at a dollar apiece and cases of expensive jewelry as favors may express a generous hospitality on your part and a desire to gratify the acquaintances you would convert into friends they will surely be set down to ostentatious display of means that few of the guests possess help from books there are manuals of etiquette which will keep you from open solecisms in social usages follow their rules obediently curbing all disposition to originality for a while at least if possible keep the greedy society reporter at a distance without angering her do not give away the list of those invited much less the menu as dick fanshawe's eulogist said of men who jump upon their mothers some does you know some even send into the newspapers unsolicited descriptions of their entertainments with lists of guests to the amusement of the editorial office these mistakes give occasion to the aforementioned cartoonists and joke vendors to deride the name of hospitality dispensed by the newly rich clan let the aforesaid manual of etiquette be followed with obedience but not with servile and unthinking obedience unfortunately it is true that the person unaccustomed to precise social regulations and to a formal manner of living is inclined to consider the rules governing such life as arbitrary inexplicable and mysterious if the uninitiated woman will disabuse herself of this idea she has taken a long step in the right direction once you accept the fact that there is reason behind the forms employed by society it will not be long before you will be searching for the reason itself the laws governing the conventional world will then acquire for you a meaning that will make adherence to them simple and natural instead of stiff and mechanical learn to discriminate the matter of discriminating properly in questions of taste is a thing much more difficult to learn than the set and definite rules governing definite exigencies of social life yet taste taste in clothes taste in the objects surrounding one taste in all matters with which expenditure is concerned this is a necessity in the attainment of any social position worthy of the name in this direction something may be gained by observation though not until the eye is sufficiently trained to make it a trustworthy guide the sense of beauty is somewhat a matter of cultivation and its application to everyday life is the result of experience and judgment 
do not imagine that a color is becoming to you merely because you happen to like it do not buy a chair or a couch simply because the one or the other may happen to please your fancy the color you wear the furniture you buy must have reference the one to your appearance and the other to its surroundings consulting authorities when one is unversed in these matters it is best to submit problems to an authority it is wiser to allow a clever modista to select the color style and material of one's gown than to do it oneself it is better to put the scheme of decoration for your house into the hands of some accomplished person educated to that end than to attempt it yourself in large cities persons competent in this matter of household decoration may easily be found people whose business it is to act as paid agents of the more beautiful and aesthetic way many architects have in their employ persons who are capable of advising as to the interior decoration and of superintending the work if one is resident in a small place the difficulty is obviated by the intelligent aid offered to the questioner through the columns of better magazines devoted to aesthetics as applied to everyday living the advice given in the best of these publications is conscientious careful expert advice one especial point in the house furnishing is worth noting do not crowd your beautiful oriental rugs together but leave a surface of polished floor about each rugs are floor pictures and should have frames as well as wall pictures do the effect of putting them close upon one another although seen in many houses otherwise well ordered is inartistic as to lion hunting mrs newlyrich is frequently criticized for her frequent fondness for lion hunting this is not always fair if she hunt because of the glory she hopes to heap on herself she deserves ridicule but if she do it in the spirit of genuine appreciation and a desire to give a rare pleasure to her friends she performs a real service to art and to society and merits praise for her courage and kindness not censure if the woman who is now wealthy was once a trained nurse or a stenographer do not let her be ashamed of the fact now if she is frank and simple about the matter sensible people will respect her for having been honorably employed if she tries to hide the truth everyone will despise her for it if she avoid the phrase and the thought back of it so often heard getting into society and will remember that all gentle aspiring persons are already members of the best society she will be helped to steer her bark aright beware of any person who attempts to exploit you for revenue only on the other hand if you find someone for who reasons of sincere liking undertakes to show you the social ropes you will be fortunate the value of modesty i have said that it is not your fault that you were not born in the purple neither is it of your merit and to your honor that you now walk in silk attire and may freely gratify dreams you would once have considered wildly impossible a certain steadiness of attitude should be striven for don't be like a bell answering helplessly to every contact imitate in your manner that large nobility of horatio of whom hamlet said a man that fortunes buffets and rewards has ta'en with equal thanks they are not a pipe for fortune's finger to sound what stop she please the best of all books enjoins on the suddenly exalted to be mindful of the pit from whence they were digged purse pride is contemptible in its meanness and folly you are safe from ridicule if you keep this fact in mind set up me and mine in pearl type and not in capitals a final injunction do not assume knowledge of what you are really ignorant to do this is to lay traps for yourself and to multiply embarrassments try to forestall the situation by private questioning if you cannot do this say frankly that you do not know end of section twenty nine recording by tracy butterick Section 30 of Marion Harlan's Complete Etiquette. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tracy Butterick. Marion Harland's Complete Etiquette by Marion Harland. Chapter 30. Delicate Points for Our Girl. This chapter is perhaps rather a familiar talk with our girl on the proprieties, which she may not recognize as such, than the emphasizing of various points of etiquette. But the violation of the essentials of self-respect is so common that a book of this character should have a chapter devoted to a bit of plain speaking to the young woman of today. We may call her actions, under certain circumstances, a violation of the proprieties, or of etiquette, or of conventionality, or perhaps it is a sin against all three. We are accustomed to seeing the sign, hands off, hung upon dainty fabrics, pure spotless materials that would be injured and stained by the touching of a gloved or bare hand. People who admire the pure beauty of the article thus marked do not resent the sign. They see the wisdom of it and are willing to obey the mandate, for a fabric once soiled never looks the same again. All the chemicals in the country cannot give it the peculiar, pristine freshness that was once its chief beauty. To those who appreciate the beauty of youth, its pure freshness, the thought of its being touched by indiscriminate hands is abhorrent. Keeping a man's respect we have happily passed the Lydia Languish age, the day in which the young girl was a fragile creature given to fainting and hysterics, clothed in innocence that was ignorance, good because she was afraid to be naughty, or because she was so hedged in by conventionalities that she did not have the opportunity to stray near the outer edge of the pasture bars. In her place, we have a healthy, fearless, clear-eyed young person looking life and its possibilities square in the face. Good, because she knows from observation or hearsay what evil is, and abhors it because it is evil. She is a sister, a chum, a jolly companion to the boy or man with whom she associates. She rides, walks, golfs, or dances with him. She may do, and she does, all these things, and she still keeps his respect. Thus far we go, and then creeps in the sinister question. Does she always do this? The answer comes promptly. It is her own fault if she loses any man's respect. To those of us who have outstepped girlhood, who have begun to live deeply these lives of ours that are full of potentialities for good or evil, there comes a keen insight and with that insight, our outer sight becomes more clear. And sometimes, in looking at young people, we find our hearts and almost our lips crying out, Don't! The Bloom of the Peach We would not be, we are not, prudes. But the bloom of the peach is beautiful, and once rubbed off, it cannot be replaced. The snow-white fabric is too fair to be carelessly handled. The Responsibility of Girls Last winter I sat in a train seat behind a girl of eighteen and a young man a few years her senior. She was pretty and bright. She chatted gaily with her companion, who after a few minutes threw his arm over the back of her seat. To the initiated, it was evidently done as a trial as to whether that kind of thing would be allowed. The girl, intent on the conversation, appeared not to notice the action. In a few moments, the hand resting against the girl's shoulder was laid over the shoulder. The owner flushed, made some laughing protest, but evidently administered no rebuke, as the offending member continued to rest where it was, then gradually crept up toward her neck. Finally, at some teasing remark of hers, it tweaked her ear. Had the child been older, the look in the man's eyes as he watched the fluctuations of color in her pretty face would have warned her that she was playing with fire. 
that his respect for her would have been greater had she shown in the beginning that the sign hands off was on her person although invisible to the vulgar eye this is but one of the many instances of the free and easy actions on the part of men permitted by well-meaning girls in nine hundred and ninety-nine cases out of a thousand a man will not take a liberty with a girl unless she allows it is bernard shaw right i wish girls would bear this fact in mind men are what they make them what they allow them to be when a young fellow told a man in my presence last week that such and such a girl was a jolly sort and while out driving had stopped at a roadhouse with him gone into the parlor of the house and taken a glass of ginger ale while he had one of whiskey i was not surprised that the man of the world to whom he imparted this fact remarked crooked eh that the young fellow who had he been older or less easily flattered would not have related the occurrence flushed and laughingly denied the allegation did not alter the fact that the conclusion drawn was inevitable the young girl may not probably did not deserve the stricture passed on her but by her free and easy behavior she lost something she never can regain men may pay attention to girls who ignore the conventionalities who allow them doubtful liberties but they like them because they are what they term fun such girls are not for those whom men live for whom they sacrifice bad habits for whom they look in seeking a wife and for whom they would bravely give up life if necessary the true love of a good man is worth winning it is not won by the girl who lowers herself in the man's eyes to her might apply the time-worn toast of a man to the new woman once our superior now our equal another point to which i would draw the attention of our girl is that the man should make the advances should do the seeking and the courting to this she would reply why of course all girls know that they may know it theoretically but does every girl live up to that knowledge does she always wait to be sought to be won without taking a hand herself at assisting destiny i think observation will not prove that she does in this very free and easy age when men are too busy seeking the elusive mighty dollar to be over-eager to show marked attention to girls it is often the young woman who pays heed to some of the preliminaries of the courting period it is frequently she who suggests to a man after meeting him several times that she would be glad to have him call it is she who when he is going on a journey asks him if he will not write to her it is she who asks him for his picture and on occasion offers him one of hers keeping one's self-respect it is and has been through the centuries the place of the man to take the initiative in such matters if he wants to call on a girl let him as a rule have the courage to ask her if he may do so if he wishes to correspond with her he should ask her permission to write to her and if he does none of these things of his own volition they may go undone the girl who through love of admiration or the desire for men's attention takes these initial steps loses her self-respect and unless the man in question be an exceptional instance awakens in his breast a sensation of amused interest he is flattered and a bit contemptuous as time goes on and he likes the girl more and more that feeling may be forgot but it is always lying there dormant and may arise some time just when the young woman would most wish for respect and love men prize that which they have had difficulty in winning the apple that drops over ripe at one's feet is never quite so tempting as that which hangs just beyond reach it is well for the matter of sex to be put out of mind in many of the dealings between young men and young women but in the question of loverly attentions it cannot be ignored and in this matter it is the man and the man only who should make advances it is better for her peace of mind that a girl should never have the marked attention of any man than that she should forget her maidenly dignity in order to acquire it 
such acquisition is certainly not worth the price paid for it a man must look up to that which he loves and a hard and fast rule is the slangy one that declares that one does not run after a car when he has already caught it or when it stands at the corner waiting for him and ready to start or stand at his will the girls for whom men find life worth living are those who are ideals as well as companions hands off dear girls be happy be merry have all the harmless fun that the good god who wishes you to be happy sends your way but for the sake of the man who may one day seek you and win you for the sake of the womanhood that he would honor let all men know that you are labeled hands off and that you are not to be cheaply gained they will love you better respect and honor you more for that knowledge a serious mistake often made by girl students and working girls is taking the men who call on them to their rooms in most cases these rooms are fitted up with couches to look much like sitting rooms but the men know they are not sitting rooms and the girl who receives men thus suffers for it in name if not in fact it is a thing that a self-respecting girl cannot afford to do even once if she expects to have men call on her she must choose a room in a house where she may occasionally have the use of a parlor the ruling may seem hard but there is no getting round it no young girl can afford to accept a luncheon or dinner invitation from a married man or indeed any attention whatsoever it does not matter that he may be an old friend of the family those who see her may not know this and even if they do may not acquit her of harm for similar seasons a girl employed as a secretary in a man's office should take care that the relation between her and her employer is purely one of business good taste in jest delicacy in conversation one of the unfailing tests of good breeding is what one laughs at without becoming priggish a girl should discriminate between what is a fit subject for jest and what is entitled to her reverence as a rule jests about birth death and marriage are to be avoided a special word of suggestion must be given in connection with the first of these subjects if you are to speak of a woman who is to become a mother say frankly that she is expecting or bearing a child the euphemisms employed in place of this plain phrase are unspeakably vulgar it is never vulgar to be frank if the person and the circumstances justify the introduction of the subject at all one must often wish for more of the old-fashioned reserve on intimate topics a critic of modern women said of them recently among themselves women lose more delicacy than any man could take from them when one listens aghast to the talk of some modern women one can but echo the statement akin to this unbecoming freedom of speech is the lack of consideration sometimes shown to an expectant mother by her friends comments in such instances one would suppose would be recognized as the height of indelicacy but thoughtlessly and in a spirit of jest remarks are made that cause a sensitive person to wince unless the mother-to-be confides her sacred expectations she has every right to have them treated with the respect of silence and only a vulgar-minded woman will intrude upon her end of section thirty recording by tracy butterick section thirty one of marion harland's complete etiquette this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b marion harland's complete etiquette by marion harland our own and other people's children constance fenimore woolson in one of her novels thus describes a discourtesy to which mothers of young children are much given talking with a mother when her children are in the room is the most trying thing conversationally she listens to you with one ear but the other is listening to johnny right in the midst of something very pathetic you are telling her she will give a sudden perfectly irrelevant smile 
over her baby's last crow and your best story is hopelessly spoiled because she loses the point although she pretends she has it while she arranges the sashes of ethel and totsy there is a protest in the paragraph quoted that will find an answering groan in many a heart who of us does not wish that mothers of small children would adopt a few rules of ordinary politeness and courtesy and when talking to a guest give attention that is not shared and almost monopolized by the child who happens to be present parents making the mistake of thinking that their children must be as absorbingly interesting to all visitors and acquaintances as they are to those to whom they belong this is a vast mistake no matter how fond one may be of the young of his species one does enjoy a conversation into which they are not dragged and talks with more freedom if they are not present certainly it is far better for the child to learn to run off and amuse himself than to sit by listening to talk not meant for his ears those of us who were children many years ago were not allowed to make nuisances of ourselves to the extent that children of to-day do and surely we were happy in one home there is a small boy very good and very affectionate whose mother cannot receive a caller without the presence of the ubiquitous infant he sits still his great eyes fixed upon the face of the caller and she feels ashamed for wishing that he would get out of the room occasionally he varies the monotony by saying mother don't you want to tell mrs blank about what i said the other day when i was hurt and did not cry or mother do you think mrs blank would like me to recite my new poem to her this may be annoying but it is still more pitiful to talk so much to a child and of him in the presence of others that he is a poser at the early age of five is cruel to the little one himself we frown on the old adage which declared children should be seen and not heard but there are homes in which the guest wishes that they might be invisible as well as inaudible one mother defers constantly to her fourteen-year-old son and allows him to be present during all chats she has with her friends she says you do not mind will i am sure you may say what you like where he is for he is the soul of discretion and i talk freely with him but the visitor does not feel the same confidence in will and certainly objects to expressing all her opinions with regard to people and things in his presence our own children are intensely interesting the children of other people are as a rule not let us once in a while put ourselves in the place of another person and think if we are willing to have that person's child always in the room when we would talk confidentially with her i think if we are frank we shall acknowledge that while we do not mind the presence of our own children we do talk more freely when other people's children are not present said a man not long ago mrs brown is a marvellous woman she is one of the most devoted mothers i know her children are with her a great part of the time yet whenever i call there alone or with a friend a signal from her empties the drawing-room or library of the entire flock of five infants and she is just as much interested in what her callers have to say as if she had no youngsters cruising about in the offing it is not to be supposed that children are never to be allowed to come into the drawing-room they should be trained to enter the room greet the guests politely and without embarrassment answer frankly and straightforwardly and to speak when spoken to then they should be silent unless drawn into the conversation the truest kindness is after a few moments to let the little ones run away and play with their toys or in the outdoor air the child who hangs his head shyly and refuses to speak politely to any one who addresses him should be taught the courtesy of friendliness from the cradle a baby may be taught to see people and as soon as he is old enough to return a greeting he must be trained to do so the only way to make small ladies and gentlemen of children is to teach first of all perfect obedience this is in this day an unpopular doctrine for there is prevalent a theory that the child must be allowed to exercise his individuality in other words to do as he pleases why the child should develop his individuality and the parents curb theirs may be matter for wonder 
to those not educated up to this twentieth century standard of ethics if day should speak and multitude of years should teach wisdom the father and mother are better fitted to dictate to the child than the child to dictate to them and yet in the average home the last mentioned form of government often prevails nothing is more unkind than to allow a child to do always as he pleases for as surely as he lives he must learn sooner or later to yield to authority and to exercise self-control the earlier the training begins the easier it will be the child creeping about the room soon knows that the gentle but firm no when spoken by the mother means that he must not touch the bit of bric-a-brac within reach and even this lesson will stand him in good stead later on the basic principle of home government must be love enforced by firmness a punishment should seldom be threatened but if threatened must be given the time for threat and punishment is not in public in the parlor on the train or boat it is the height of ill-breeding to make a scene and to threaten a punishment of any kind were the child properly trained in private parents and beholders would be spared the humiliating spectacle that too often confronts them in visiting and travelling one word here as to the child on train or boat the person who is truly well-bred will not turn and frown on the mother of the tiny baby who suffering with colic or sore from travelling is wailing aloud of course the sound is annoying but it is harder on the poor mortified mother than on any one else i already hear the question why doesn't she keep the infant at home then frequently she cannot do this the child may be ill and be on its way to seashore or mountains to gain health or the mother may be summoned to see some relative and cannot go unless the baby goes too whatever the cause of her going the fact remains that she derives no pleasure from holding a screaming baby and her discomfort is turned into positive anguish by the disgusted looks of the women and the muttered imprecations of the men i saw once under such circumstances a woman who was an honor to her sex opposite her in the train sat a young mother and in her arms was a fretful wailing baby it was evidently the first baby and the poor girlish mother was white and weary at every scream the baby gave she would start nervously change the little one's position look about at the passengers with an expression of pathetic apology all the time keeping up a crooning shh that produced no effect on the crying atom of humanity and as is often the case the more nervous the mother became the more nervous did the baby grow and the louder did he scream an exclamation of impatience came from a woman seated behind the suffering twain and at the same moment a man in front threw down his paper with a slam and rushed out of the car and into the smoker then the woman who was an honor to her sex came across from the seat opposite and laid a gentle hand on the mother's shoulder smiling reassurance in the tear-filled eyes lifted to hers my dear said the soft voice you are worn out and the baby knows it let me take him for a minute no don't protest i have had four of my own and they are all too big for me to hold in my arms now i just long to feel that baby against my shoulder give him to me there now you poor tired little mother put your head down on the back of the seat and rest she took the baby across the aisle laid him over her shoulder with his head against her cheek in the comforting way known to all baby lovers and in three minutes the cries had subsided and the baby was asleep in the strong motherly arms where he lay until jersey city was reached and the tired little mother fell into a light slumber too comforted by the appreciation that she was not alone nor an intolerable nuisance to all her fellow passengers was not such an act as this woman's the perfection of true courtesy the courtesy that forgets itself in trying to make another comfortable the same spirit spoken of by st paul as in honor preferring one another can be inculcated in the children in our homes the small of the human species are like their elders naturally selfish and must be taught consideration for others it is the grafting that makes the rose what it is you may graft a jacques minot or marechal neil upon the stump of the wild rose 
the grafting the pruning and the training are the work of the careful gardener the mother can never be idle for while the stock is there she does the grafting obedience must be taught in small things as well as in great the tiny child must be taught to remove his hat when he is spoken to to give his hand readily in greeting to say please and thank you not to pass in front of people or between them and the fire to say excuse me when he treads on his mother's foot or dress to rise when she enters the room and to take off his hat when he kisses her the mother who insists that her child do these things at home need not fear that he will forget her training when abroad end of section thirty one section thirty two of marion harlan's complete etiquette this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c marion harlan's complete etiquette by marion harland our neighbors the fact that people live next door to you does not make them your neighbors in the higher and better sense of the word there may be nothing in their persons or characters to commend them to you or for that matter to commend you to them neighborhood in literal interpretation signifies nearness of vicinity you have the right to choose your associates and to elect your friends presuming on this truth dwellers in cities are prone to vaunt their ignorance of and indifference to those who live in the same street block and apartment house with themselves if newly come to what is a kingdom by comparison with their former estate they make a point of seeking society elsewhere than among residents of their neighborhood let us be genteel or die says dickens of mrs fielding's struggles to eat dinner with gloves on let us be exclusive or cease to live says mrs upstart and refuses to learn the names of her neighbors on the right and left one of the hallmarks of the thoroughbred is his daily application of the maxim live and let live his social standing is so firm that a jostle or even a push from a vulgarian who chances to pass his way cannot disturb him when the mongrel cur bayed at the moon the moon kept on shining if he be a gentleman in heart as well as in blood and name he has a real interest in people who breathe the same air and tread the same street with himself interest as far removed from vulgar curiosity in other people's concerns as the gentle curiosity of his demeanor is removed from the familiar bumptiousness of the forward and underbred chance salutations entering ourself as learners in his school and we could not study manners in a better we recognize our neighbors as such if we live on the same block and meet habitually on the street a civil bow in passing a smile to a child in chance encounters in market or shop a word of salutation be it only a good morning or it is a fine day or after a few exchanges of this sort i hope your family keeps well in this trying weather are tokens of good will and appreciation of the fact that we are dwellers in the same world town and neighborhood courteous inquiries none of these minute courtesies which you owe to yourself and to your neighbor lays on you any obligation to call or invite her to call on you failure to comprehend this social by-law often causes heart-burnings and downright resentment 
you may thus meet and greet a woman living near you every day for twenty years and if some stronger bond than the accident of proximity does not draw you together you may know nothing more of her than her name and address at the end of time perhaps the address alone unless indeed casually in the way of fire personal injury or severe illness makes expedient and to the humane such expediency is an obligation further recognition of the tie of neighborhood in either of the cases indicated send to ask after the health of the sufferer and if you can be of service if there be a death in the house a civil inquiry to the same effect and a card of sympathy will commit you to nothing we are working now on the assumption that each of us has a sincere desire to brighten the pathway of others to make this hard business of daily living more tolerable of all the passive endurances of life strangerhood is one of the hardest to the sensitive spirit your neighbor's heart is lighter because you show that you are aware of her existence and in some sort recognize her identity she may not be your congener your bow and smile remind her that you are her fellow human being stranger ships meeting in mid-ocean do not wait to inspect credentials before exchanging salutes if your neighbor be an acquaintance whom you esteem do not let her be in doubt on this point in plantation days in antebellum days at the south neighborhood was a powerful bond of sympathy miles meant less to them in this respect than so many squares meant to us now a system of wireless telegraphy connected plantations for an area of many miles joy or sorrow set the current in motion from one end to the other what i have called elsewhere being kitchenly kind was comprehended in perfection in that bygone time when the house mother sent a pot of preserves to her neighbor with her love and she would like to know how you all are today it was the outward and substantial sign of the inward grace of loving kindness and not an imitation that the recipient's preserve closet was not so well stocked as the giver's when opened hamper and unfolded napkin showed a quarter of a lamb or a steak or a roll of homemade sausage meat enough neighborly love garnished the gift to make it beautiful out of fashion nowadays tis true tis true tis pity and pity tis tis true the best people enough of the old-time spirit lives among our really best people to justify the kitchenly kind in proffering gifts that presuppose personal liking and active desire to please a neighbor a cake compounded by yourself a plate of homemade rolls taken from your own table a dainty fancy dish of sweets and home manufacture express more of the real thing than a box of confectionery or a basket of flowers put up by a florist it is the personal touch that glorifies the gift the consciousness that your neighbor thinks enough of you to give of her time and service for your pleasure the homemade offering partakes of her individuality and appeals to yours neighborliness does not of necessity imply familiarity of manner and speech that may be become offensive or a continuous performance of visits calls and dropping ins that must inevitably become a bore however congenial may be the association those friendships last longest where certain decorous forms are always observed 
no matter how close the mutual affection may be mrs stowe in one of her new england stories describes the intercourse between two families as sort of an undress intimacy reading further we find that this dishabille companionship involves visits by way of the back door and at all sorts of unconventional hours back door visiting such abandonment of the reserves that etiquette enjoins on every household is a dangerous experiment the back porch is for family use your next-door neighbor may not meddle therewith personally i do not want my own son or my married daughters to enter my house through the kitchen if you dear reader would retain your footing in the house of the friend best loved by you come in by the front door and never without announcing your presence as any other visitor would steady persistence in this rule will avoid the chances of divers unpleasant possibilities your hostess or her husband or grown son may be as much in dishabille as the intimacy which in your opinion warrants you in running in and up without knock or ring you may happen on a love scene or a family quarrel or a girl may be in the hands of the treasure of a hairdresser who shampoos her twice a month with pure water that looks like peroxide of hydrogen and restores the subject's dark brown tresses to the guiltless flaxen of her forgotten babyhood or your clattering heels upon the stairway may break the touchy old grandmother's best afternoon nap there is but one place on earth where it is safe to make yourself perfectly at home and that is your own house or apartment or chamber end of section thirty two recording by linda marine hilson vancouver b c section thirty three of marion harlan's complete etiquette this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by laura langston marion harlan's complete etiquette by marion harland church and parish theoretically the church is a pure democracy a mighty family there if anywhere the rich and the poor meet together on terms of absolute equality in that least poetical of pious jingles blessed be the tie that binds we declare that the fellowship of kindred minds is like to that above these and other pietistic platitudes whether tame or tuneful are technical and so nearly meaningless as not to provoke debate every reasonable man and woman knows and does not affect to conceal his or her consciousness of the truth that social distinctions are not effaced by the enrolment of rich and poor educated and illiterate refined and boorish in impartial order upon the church books true religion does refine feeling and engender benevolence and charitable judgment of our fellows in doing this it creates a common ground of sympathy as of belief it elevates the moral and spiritual nature of itself it does not enrich the intellect or polish manners one may have a clean heart and dirty flesh-and-blood hands may be a sincere and earnest christian yet double his negatives shove his food into his mouth with his knife prefer the corner of a tablecloth to a napkin and be an alien in the matter of finger-bowls it is possible that two women may work together harmoniously in church and parish associations each esteeming the other's excellent qualities of heart and enjoying the fellowship of her kindred mind and yet that both should be intensely uncomfortable if forced into reciprocal social relations that have nothing to do with church or charity the reasonable view these are plain facts no reasonable person will dispute in view of them the fact equally patent that the newly rich clan sometimes resort to church connection as a lever to raise them to a higher social plane is one of the anomalies of human intercourse that may well stir the satirist to bitter ridicule and move compassionate beholders to wonder when they begin to feel their oats they go off to you laughed the keen-witted 
sweet-natured pastor of a downtown church to a brother clergyman whose flock worshipped in a finer building and a fashionable neighborhood the sheep with the golden fleece always finds a breach in our church wall it takes him his ewe and his lambs a long time to learn that pew proximity does not bring about social sympathy it is not a week since i saw a girl a thoroughbred from crown to toe flush in surprise and draw herself up in unconscious hauteur when a flashily dressed young person greeted her across the vestibule of a concert room with hello nelly didn't we have a bully time last night they had attended a sunday school anniversary and as their classes were side by side had exchanged remarks in the intervals of recitations songs and addresses the parvenu's clothes were more costly than nelly's her father was richer they were members of the same church to her vulgar mind these circumstances gave her the right to take a liberty with a slight acquaintance such as no well-bred person would have dreamed of assuming your pew neighbor first then i place among the maxims of church and parish etiquette do not imagine that your next pew neighbor must be your friend if she be a newcomer and a stranger in the congregation bow to her in meeting in lobby or in aisle cordially recognizing her as a fellow worshipper in a temple where all are welcome and equal if you can be of service to her in finding the place of hymn or psalm should she be at a loss perform the neighborly service tactfully and graciously always because you are in the house of the all-father and are his children not that you seek to court a mortal's favor for any ulterior purpose in meeting her on the street let your salutation be ready and pleasant but not familiar don't hello nelly her then or ever while bearing in mind that non-recognition of one you know to be a regular attendant at the same church with yourself yet a comparative stranger there is unkind and unchristian the stranger in church the case is different if you are the stranger friendly advances should come from the other side if they are not made there is nothing for you to do but to content yourself with the recollection that you go to church to worship god not to make acquaintances never depend on your church connection for society if you find congenial associates there rejoice in the happy circumstance and make the most of it if you do not do not rail at the congregation as stiff and stuck up at the church as a hollow sham and the pastor as an unfaithful shepherd the expectation on the part of some people that he should neglect the weightier matters of the law and the gospel and prostitute his holy office by becoming a social pudding-stick for incorporating into a jolly crowd the diverse elements of those to whom he is called to minister disgraces humanity and civilization not to say christianity pew hospitality pew hospitality has fallen into disuse to a great extent of late years principally on account of the usher service the tendency of this partial desuetude is to make pew owners utterly careless of their obligation to entertain strangers regard for the best interests of your particular church organization should suggest to you as a duty that you notify the usher in your aisle of your willingness to receive strangers into your pews whenever the one or two vacant seats there may be needed if your family fills them all every sunday you cannot exercise the grace of hospitality when one or two or three are to be absent from either service however take the trouble to apprise the oft sorely perplexed official of the fact and give him leave to bring to your door any one he has to seat when the stranger appears let him see at once that you esteem his coming a pleasure give him a good seat a book and a welcome generally by this behavior you commend to his favor your church human nature and the cause dearest to your heart if you are the visiting worshipper and it is evident that the other occupants of the pew are the owners thereof make courteous and grateful acknowledgment at the close of the service of the hospitality you have received i hope the return you get will not be the cold supercilious stare one true gentlewoman had from the holder of a pew in the middle aisle of a fashionable church in new york the guest put into mrs hotone's pew thanked the latter simply and gracefully for the opportunity given her of hearing an admirable sermon who are you that dare address me said the silent stare it is bad enough to have my pew invaded by an unvouched for stranger without being subjected to the impertinence of speech the last place upon god's earth where incivility and the arrogance of self-conceit are admissible is his house be pitiful writes the apostle who learned his code of manners from one who has been not irreverently called the truest gentleman who ever lived 
be pitiful, be courteous. The pastor's family, the pastor's call. The relations of parishioner and the pastor's family are often strained hard by the popular misconception of the social obligations existing, or that should exist, between them. In no call that I ever heard of is the clergyman enjoined to cater to the whims and vanities of exacting members by visits that are not demanded by spiritual or temporal needs, and which minister to nothing but the aforesaid jealous vanity. Send for a clergyman when his priestly offices are required. For the rest of his precious time let him come as he likes, and go whither he considers his duty calls him. He was a man before he took orders, and the man has social rights. Let him neighbor, as old-fashioned folk used to say, with his kind. The aforesaid call makes no mention of his family. If you like to call on them when they come to the parish, and if you find them congenial, your congeners, in fact, keep up the association as you would with your doctor's or your lawyer's family. That you belong to Dr. Barnabas's parish, that you are the wife or daughter of an officer in his church, gives you absolutely no claim on his wife or daughters beyond what you individually possess. To demand that Mrs. Barnabas, refined in every instinct, highly educated and with tastes for what is best and highest in social companionship, should be bullied and patronized by Mrs. Million, a purse-proud vulgarian, unlearned and stupid, is sheer barbarity. Yet we see it, and worse, in many American churches. A False Assumption do you, sensible and amenable reader, lead the way to better things, loosen at least one buckle of the harness that bows many a fine spirit to breaking, and makes the church a smoke in the nostrils of unprejudiced outsiders? Separate ecclesiastical from social relations. Owe your right to call a fellow parishioner friend, and to visit at manse or parsonage or rectory to what you are, not to the adventitious circumstance of being a member in good standing in a fashionable or an unfashionable church exact no consideration from those who belong with you to the household of faith on the ground of that spiritual fellowship the position is false the claim ignoble no matter what church one is in one should always try to conform as far as possible to its order of worship not to do this shows a want of proper reverence End of section thirty three Recording by Laura Langston Section 34 of Marian Harlan's Complete Etiquette This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Betty B. Marian Harlan's Complete Etiquette by Marian Harland The Woman's Club the popularity of women's societies for literary study for economic discussion for the consideration of municipal and social improvement is enormous they are to be found all over the country but particularly do they flourish in the middle west where every town and hamlet in the region boasts a woman's club of some sort both ridicule and praise are showered upon these organizations and they deserve both some of their manifestations are crude absurd and tiresome others are fine in themselves exert a broadening influence over those intimately concerned and are helpful indirectly to the whole community represented by them however much particular societies may lay themselves open to adverse criticism by reason of priggishness superficiality or a mistaken sense of their importance in the scheme of things it must be acknowledged that the general tendency of these organizations is good they lift women out of the consideration of the commonplace domestic side of existence they encourage toleration and a give-and-take attitude toward life in which attitude women are often lacking they open a way for the development of latent talent of various kinds they are often stepping stones to improvement in the social life of a community it would be hard to estimate how much they have done in creating an atmosphere for the truly artistic and literary element in various communities throughout the united states no doubt they have in this way encouraged the production of literature and other forms of art while in humbler fashion they have brought pleasure and an outlook into many narrow circumscribed lives an englishwoman visiting in a western city of our country was asked what one of our institutions she admired the most the woman's club she replied without hesitation 
and added that she would like to transplant it to her native land where it was true there were associations of women banded together for various purposes but none in which women met in such easy and happy intellectual relations as in the women's clubs of america such praise from an unprejudiced observer of our country consoles the woman who believes in the mission of the woman's club despite many an ugly newspaper fling the english woman in question was fortunate in attending a club of particular interest and value where to a degree the ideal of what a woman's club should be was realized such a club indicates the possibilities of the institution however and many organizations of women are working with crude material through absurd phases toward accomplishment as happy in small communities where the opportunities are infrequent for theatre for social diversion of various kinds the woman's club is of the greatest help it serves at once to focus and distribute all the better social and intellectual interests of the neighborhood it may be a means of lifting a whole community to a livelier and more interesting social and intellectual level many women's clubs become important factors in municipal legislation along the lines most amenable to feminine influence through such clubs women have helped to solve educational questions have influenced public sentiment in the direction of cleaning and beautifying the streets and in many other ways have helped to promote law and order the literary club is however the form most often taken by feminine organizations the formation of a literary club is not a difficult matter though the amount of red tape with which it is sometimes covered up makes the project seem formidable the woman most interested in the organization of such a club should call a meeting at her house of those she thinks most likely to enter into the scheme with energy and profit a perusal of robert's rules of order or of any other good manual of parliamentary law will show how such a meeting should be conducted how officers should be elected and a constitution adopted it may be said in this connection that there are few matters harder for a woman to digest gracefully than a knowledge of parliamentary usages such knowledge is for use only not for display to make a show of it is like using a kitchen utensil for a drawing-room ornament many women seem to regard the rules governing societies as important in themselves they are only important as the knowledge and use of them quickens the business proceedings leading up to the real purpose of the organization business in a woman's club founded for study and improvement is only a means to an end it is disastrous to consider it otherwise the membership having been decided upon the officers selected and constitution adopted the next and most important thing in a literary club is to make out the program for this purpose an executive committee of three or more is appointed by the president or elected by the club sometimes this committee makes out the entire program merely notifying each member of the part she is expected to take in its performance sometimes the members are consulted as to what subjects they prefer the more arbitrary method is often necessary in order to procure unity of design in the program if for instance the program for the day includes two papers and a discussion following the subjects considered should be related so as to make some sort of harmony if each member is allowed to choose her subject regardless of anything but her own desire small pleasure or profit follows in some clubs the executive committee sends out cards to the members asking for suggestions accepts the best of these and when possible assigns the topics preferred if the first mentioned and more arbitrary method is followed the committee should be careful to select subjects according to the persons for whom they are designed mrs brown who loves poetry but knows nothing of science should not be asked to handle the wonders of electricity in the twentieth century and mrs white who has a delicious touch in narrating personal experiences but knows little of continental fiction would better be asked to write a paper on her summer vacation than one on the great russian novelists turgenieff and tolstoy of course the practice for mrs brown and mrs white in considering subjects opposed to their knowledge and taste might be salutary for them 
but it might also send the other members of the club to sleep and the ambition of the executive committee should be to avoid as much dullness as possible in the atmosphere it partly creates whether the program shall be miscellaneous in character or shall be devoted to progressive study in one direction is a question to be considered by the committee if the club is small compact in spirit and on improvement bent the study of some one period author or movement is often most advantageous if the club is large and entertainment is largely the motive for meeting a program that varies to meet the various demands of the membership is better usually the number of papers on a given day should not exceed two sometimes owing to the light or easily divisible nature of the theme for the day three papers of fifteen or twenty minutes each may be assigned for the discussion that should follow the paper or papers it is the custom generally in women's clubs to appoint a leader the selection of leaders for conversation should be carefully made not every woman who writes a good paper talks well though it is possibly within her power to do so if she makes sufficient effort the leader of a conversation should be one who has been tried in general discussion and found successful upon the leader depends the guidance of the talk if it drifts into foolish and unprofitable channels it is her business to call it back to better issues yet to do so with what shall not seem a meddling or arbitrary touch the cultivation of the gift of speech is in the minds of many competent judges the best thing offered us by the woman's club only a skilled person should undertake leadership in a discussion but the floor of the club is a school where all may learn something of the art to learn to think quickly to express one's self standing and facing an audience this is an accomplishment worth having and one which many a club woman owes to years of progressive effort in a woman's club members should be taken into a club because they have qualifications which will add to the pleasure and profit of the membership at large one should not vote for or against a candidate for purely personal reasons many kind people who are yet ignorant of the proper law for limiting the membership of a club consider it an act of enmity to blackball a candidate for membership whether she be fitted for that membership or not this is a mistaken and a sentimental theory it is indeed disagreeable to blackball but it is sometimes necessary those who propose members for a club should feel the responsibility of such proposals and thus as far as lies within their power avoid for the membership or committee controlling this matter the unpleasant necessity of refusing or blackballing a candidate the new member should be received with courtesy by the older members of the club her sponsors or guarantors should see to it that proper introductions if introductions be necessary are made for several months at least after her admission to the club the new member's part should be a negative rather than a positive one it is an unwritten law in the united states senate that the new senator does not speak on any matter of importance for a year after his election exactly so modesty demands that the new member in a woman's club unless specially requested keep silent till custom has established her place in the organization when the proper occasion arises for her to speak or to read she begins her performance as others do theirs by formally addressing the president and members of the club thus madam president and women of the club in many clubs where the membership is not large and the dues are small it is customary to meet from house to house this should always be considered only a provisional method it is much better to have a club home than to wander f from place to place papers and other properties accumulate in the life of a club and it is advisable to have some permanent place for the bestowal of them the sense of getting acquainted with a new place each time interferes with ease of manner and freedom of discussion while familiarity with one's surroundings begets both these happy qualities as soon as the funds warrant the expenditure a club should rent a convenient and acceptable place where its regular meetings can be held once a year usually at the beginning of the president's term of office it is customary for the club to give some sort of entertainment for its members this may be a luncheon or breakfast a high tea or merely an afternoon reception 
where salad ices and coffee are served at this festivity after the menu has been served the retiring president bids good-bye to her office and introduces her successor who acts as toastmistress for the occasion the toasts should be few in number not more than five or six and the time occupied by each should be from five to seven minutes commonly the subjects for toasts should be of a lively pleasing nature and should be treated in a manner to correspond to take advantage of a festive occasion for the delivery of a lamentation or a sermon is in very bad taste it should be remembered by the speaker that she is expected to entertain and not to instruct the spirit of the members toward club performances should be kindly and genial if good work is to be expected nothing can be done in the face of ill-natured criticism the standard of work can only be raised by each member doing her best and keeping an open mind for the performances of her acquaintances frequently a special advantage in hearing club papers lies in one's acquaintance with the writer which makes it possible for one to interpret much more richly than would be possible in the printed page of a personally unknown author this is the unearned increment of club membership one of the best returns for its fellowship and in order to get the most out of one's connection with a literary club where in the nature of things one cannot be expecting literary masterpieces one must be on the lookout for this personal quality which adds so largely to the written and spoken words heard there end of section thirty four section thirty five of marion harland's complete etiquette this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b marion harland's complete etiquette by marion harland charities public and private charity begins at home but it is a great mistake to suppose that it should end there indeed in the last analysis to do for one's own family is not charity but a form of selfishness the truly generous spirit cannot resist the call to help the poor and needy the outcast and degraded one's relation to charity should not be accidental but should form a part of the plan of one's life it is not very creditable to give to a good cause only because one is besieged to do so or because one is ashamed to say no when the young married couple sit down together for their first discussion of finance of how much they shall spend for house for clothes how much for food how much for amusement and so on this question of what shall be done for those poorer than themselves should have a place no matter how small the sum possible something should be given to philanthropic work the woman of the family is very often directly or indirectly the dispenser of the money devoted to charity she is the one who decides into what channels it shall go she has the time for investigating the needs of societies and of individuals the work too that accompanies gifts of charity more often falls to her lot than to a man this is a department of service properly belonging to her she has natural rights in this section of the world's work of which she should be proud charities broadly are of two kinds public and private and activity in one should not preclude activity in the other the ideal administration of charity would consist in every person comfortably established having among his real friends several poor persons or poor families from whom he himself received a broadening knowledge of life as well as to whom he gave of physical necessities in the absence of this ideal situation he must avail himself of the best means open to him he must take advantage of the splendid organization of modern charities but he must not forget also to be on the lookout for individual cases of need that are not likely to appear before the board of any philanthropic organization we hear it from the pulpit and the platform continually yet not too often that organized charitable work is one of the finest achievements of our present civilization narrow-minded people sometimes say that our grandmothers got along very well without it and did as much good as the women of the present day they got on without it only because they did not have such complex conditions to cope with 
it is not possible no matter how good the intentions of the individuals concerned that as valuable work can be done without modern methods as with them in these days each charity of a city or town attempts to cover one field and to cover it as thoroughly and from as many different points of view as possible wherever possible the aim of such organizations is to help people to help themselves the idea is not only to tide the beneficiaries over temporary difficulties but to aid them in building up character by means of self-respecting effort membership in such organizations brings opportunity for action and knowledge also of the bearings of one's action it makes charity something more than a matter of sentimental impulse the opportunity to do good offered by these societies is not only an opportunity to help the poor but to help oneself and even in other ways than the one generally acknowledged of broadening one's sympathies and cultivating one's heart the gain a woman derives in discipline from working in concert with other women is of an inestimable value this discipline is sometimes accompanied by vexations as discipline commonly is but taken in the right spirit it is broadening charitable societies are often made up largely of women whose ideas of business are chaotic whose capacity for speech is not at all equal to their capacity for work the time spent by such people in idle discussion at business meetings is wearing but it is not altogether unprofitable the better trained women must do what they can to improve the situation when they cannot improve it they must grin and bear it even with the drawbacks named organization pays the experience of many is a richer thing than the experience of one and when it comes to action concerted action is a more powerful thing than single and individual effort one cannot help all the causes one would like to help or belong to the organizations that represent them one should select that charity which appeals to one most or where one feels one can do the most good and one should make attendance upon its meetings and the other work of the society a part of one's regular duties the sorrows of one's life often suggest the charity one cares most to aid women who have lost little ones feel a drawing of the heart toward the society that helps children women who have seen much of pain and suffering in their own families wish to join a society that makes the burden of the sick poor as light as possible those who have seen sympathetically the loneliness and bitterness possible to old age wish to help the aged poor and the determining personal experience makes the work of charity so much richer and more effectual one should not leave the subject of one's duty to organize philanthropy without a word concerning the work of the social settlement the greatest philanthropic movement of the day the idea at the bottom of settlement work the idea that the rich or the comfortably situated must live with the poor must know their lives by direct and continuous contact in order to exert any lasting influence for good is a noble idea in itself and one that is singularly attractive to ardent spirits unfortunately fashion and the novelty of the life involved in the experiment has made social settlement work attractive to many people for somewhat selfish reasons such people should be discouraged from going into it first because they hurt the cause they do not know how to get on with poor people and often their ill-disguised curiosity amounts to insolence and hurts those whom it is intended the work should benefit the second reason is that these people who through excitement and love of novelty leave their homes for settlement work are often needed at home it is much the vogue just now for young women just out of college to do a year of social settlement work if they have what methodists name the call and have no more urgent and intimate duties behind them this is very well but if it means deserting home tasks because they are dull and unexciting it is well enough to think twice before the mother of the family is left to face all the disagreeable issues of home life this is one of those cases where charity at home is of more importance than charity abroad of social settlement work seriously and earnestly considered it is impossible to say too much in commendation 
the philanthropic impulse of a generous heart is not satisfied with giving to organizations or working for them one must do in other and private ways in order to satisfy one's heart and conscience one should help many people through ties of service of love or of friendship in time of need one should remember those people who have lived as domestics in one's family or who have been connected in some humble capacity with the business of the head of the house these persons if they have been faithful to one's interests one helps with a personal enthusiasm that is of course lacking in the case of strangers faithful or unfaithful one knows something about them and can figure out easily what is the wisest as well as the most grateful manner of doing for them then there is the poor relation whom we have always with us and in the helping of whom all the tact of which one is possessed is not too much to use the very fact that he or she as the case may be must accept favors from one of the same blood and therefore in every sense but the financial of the same rank in life makes the graceful bestowal of the gift a matter that is hard to compass to pass on the gown one is laid aside so that there shall seem to be no condescension in the act to explain successfully that one sends money at christmas because one was uncertain what would be the proper gift to buy in fine to give with a broad sympathy that for the minute gives the donor an insight into the other's disappointments and vexations this is what is needed in dealing with the poor relative a flavor of even greater grace and delicacy must go into the gift offered by the rich friend to the poor one it is one of the privileges of the generous rich not only to feed the starving body but sometimes to feed the starving soul not only to provide bread and butter but to minister to a starved sense of beauty and of joy to give pictures and books to those who love them but cannot buy to give a year at college to some nice young fellow whose parents cannot do for him to give pretty trinkets to a pretty young girl who lives in a house where there is no money to spare for such things these gifts of friendship are one of the greatest privileges of a large income though not counted commonly as charity they come under the head of charity in its biblical significance of love and sympathy end of section thirty five